Well, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, as Paul said, I'm Ian Grant, Senior Archaeologist for Cluey Powys Archaeological Trust, and I have the honour of opening the talks this morning. Um, I want to take you back to 2022, and uh, we were undertaking a, an excavation here or an evaluation on behalf of the Newtown Town Council where we were asked to evaluate a specific site in the town uh, in order to inform with the, the management of the site. It's a scheduled scheduled monument, and it's now known as Newtown Mound. Uh, there you can see it in the picture there. It's um, They've been putting a, together a program of scrub clearance and generally trying to improve the site. It's um, quite similar to a project that was been undertaken up in North East Wales, where I come from, near Mould, a place called Bailey Hill. They're slightly ahead of the game there, a couple of years ahead of Newtown Council, taking a site that, there's no polite way of saying this, it's kind of almost turned into a kind of a den of iniquity. It's overgrown. Um, it really had become a place where there was a lot of erosion due to bicycle tracks there and people no longer really visiting the site in, this, in the spirit that it was meant to be. So they've decided to, as part of a townscape initiative, um, we were asked to help inform them so they could put the site back on the, map, on the map from a heritage point of view, clear the site up and look at ways to improve public access because it's at the moment it's quite difficult, as you'll see as we go through it this morning, where to put in steps and public access up to the area. Bring it back into the community, hopefully the legacy being that this site now becomes somewhere back on the map. And so just to, for those of you who are not familiar with the area, um, that big red blob is the site of Newtown Mound there. We are actually here. Stay. There. That's the building you're in now. There. And as you'll see, there's a, a linear red line there as well, which uh, we'll come to again because that became part of the project as well. And Paul said that the project was dealing with archaeology was just outside. Well, actually, it's a little bit more than that. It's underneath your feet as you... And unfortunately, this development uh, was a little bit ahead of our, our game because if we'd have known what we know today about this earthwork, there might have been a little bit more archaeological work went on before this building went in place, but that's that's okay. We're 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 on it now. So, um, so just to get a little bit of historical background, um, the medieval township that is Newtown, quite a, a late border town. It was established sort of around about the twelve eighties by the Mortimers, and um, there you see it down there outlined in green. Just to give some of the earlier background and why we're looking at this new town mound, we've got, we know that about a mile and a half to the east, we have Grow Trump, which is shown on this LIDAR here, which is a, a well fortified Morton Bailey site, was probably the principal fortification for this valley. And then down on the left there circled, um, circled is quite uh, <laughs> an ambitious word. I just hand draw that red line down it, as you can see. Um, we have Newtown Mound there, just on the southeast of the town. The origins of this site are fairly unknown. It could be of early Norman origin. It could be sort of late, um, or sort of early 12th century site. It also could be part of when the Mortimers established the the township in the 1280s. It could well have been part of a defence put in place for the southeast part of the town, because as you can see, it's defended on quite well and defined by the river as a defensive, but it's wide open on the southeast side. All this is subjective. They really, when we came to the table on this, we don't know whether this is just a glacial mound on a river, on the river basin. Is it a mott? with a, a lost Bailey site. Is it some kind of English Civil War defence that was thrown up? Or was it some 
prospect mound that was put for summer houses established for Newtown Hall, because we'll come to that as well in a moment, because um, that's Grow Tump there, just by the golf course. And there's a picture of Newtown Mound, March 2022, actually February 2022. We had quite a few named hurricanes in the weeks while we were on site. So what was a three-week excavation ended up being a five-week excavation. Um, we had a lot of time to wash pottery indoors. So, um, But I quite like that picture because that was one of the rare times you actually saw water in the moat. Normally it's quite dry, so you kind of get a sense of the feel of the site. It's about five metres high with a flat top to it. Uh, that's the Ordnance Survey plan for 1886. What I've done there is overlaid the medieval street plan, which we've taken from a map, uh, the Grand Seven map, which is dated to around about 1798, but you get a good idea and feel for the medieval layout of the township there. So you can see its positioning there. And then we play the game of looking for Baileys, outer Baileys. Um, Spurgeon wrote in the 1960s when he was looking at the area, he thought that this area I've circled here was a good candidate for an outer Bailey to go with the site, assuming it is a medieval monument. Alternatively, he also looked at a smaller area there, which you go out there today. That is the sort of recreational area. But otherwise, like I said, it's all rather subjective. And whilst on our journey, looking at this mound, this again is uh, OS 1885, Newtown Hall is in place still there with its outbuildings here, which is quite significant to the story. And I've highlighted there this, you can see this line, this linear line here. Those of you who are aware of this area or arrived here today, maybe something you have a look at at lunchtime if you get a chance. If you go out of here, you'll see a linear bank going that way, which used to come all the way up to the riverside, come underneath you now and to the river. It's long been believed by historians that it was of Georgian build, um, certainly sort of landscape part of the landscaping for the, for the new town hall, which was established around about 1550s. Um, we weren't so sure about that. And we're certainly not sure about that anymore. In fact, one thing I can tell you is it's not post-medieval, that linear bank, and it's not modern build. So we decided to pull that into the project. It's not protected, but we were looking for alternative things to do while we were here on site with the volunteers. I mentioned the volunteers. One of the parts of this project was to involve the uh, local community. And we had an overwhelming response to that. If you bear in mind, we'd just come out of lockdown. It was February 2022. And I think I'm right in saying, Paul, that um, we had over 120 volunteers over five weeks. And we had to shut the door on the list. We could have had a lot more than that. And that is certainly the biggest response we as a trust, I think, have had on a general community outreach. Um, I won't go into... What do you want to take that apart? I mean, we we got we did a uh, my predecessor, community archaeologist Penny Foreman. She did a little bit of a study on this, and we got a lot of feedback from the volunteers. And I think we hit it at a time when people really need to get back out there and be working alongside people. Um, and we're in the heart of an urban area that doesn't have a great deal going on in a heritage community point of view. So. Something special happened here, and um, so we hope to continue that because uh, certainly the response was there. So moving onwards, uh, just to get a sight on our linear bank there, you can see there it is. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I was can <laughs> they've got the miniature railway alongside it. I was uh, which hadn't been used for for quite some time, and then suddenly when we decided we wanted to start digging here, they started renovating the railway track, which is. <laughs> I wouldn't say annoying, but uh, sort of curtailed where I could dig. Um, that's a conversation I need to have with them again as well. So you can see um, 
these this, this centre that we're in now today at this time in 2022 it's still being built and you can see where it is in relation to the linear bank and um, so there we are you can i've just marked in there where we were hoping to put an evaluation trench across uh new town hall long gone the council houses are now in its place just to give you a little bit of background on the hall as well so 1553 um richard price vicar of kerry establishes the hall there and by the time we get to the english civil war period the town's declaring in favor of king charles I, so as a royalist garrison and john price is in the seat at newtown mound and there are very good accounts of them re um organizing the defenses of the town specifically the defense of this this earthwork so we know for sure that this certainly was a monument in place by 1640 so it's not a, i think that kind of pushes away any idea of it being a prospect mound for the hall um also there are just accounts of them whilst they're improving the defenses of this site that they wanted to flood the moat and in order to do so they improved the earthworks to the north in order to bring water in to flood the moat so i think you can start to see where we're going with this we've got a linear earthwork that's upstanding this all predates the georgian period so straight away a little bit of joined up thinking and you've got um you can dispel the idea of that linear earthwork to the north being something to go with the Georgian landscape. It's a funny shaped mound. I'm not sure whether that's the original shape of it or whether it's been interfered with. Um, we've got a summer house located in 1885 up on the top left hand corner there. So we uh, undertook a heritage assessment of the site, did some background research. So a lot of what I've just told you now is, is as a response to that. And we also did some, ge um, well, Tiger Geo did some GPR, ground penetrating radar survey of the site, which to be perfectly frank, didn't really show as much at all. Um, didn't even pick up a site of the summer house. We do know that around about, I think it was about 1908, something like that, the Royal Commission did a little excavation in the corner, top left hand corner, and they found a little stone building. So we wondered whether that was part of this summer house, a gazebo or so. So hence our trench three that we've marked on there. That, that's this one. The road to the back, I've got rid of trench one, two and three. That was targeting the site of the summer house. Just to get some idea. All that swirly in the, in the middle there. That's the bicycle track, all the erosion. And then the other two, two trenches were put in place in areas of severe erosion. This is a topographical survey that we did. This is actually <coughs> digital plans of the site. So first part of any battle when you're starting managing the site is you need a plan, a digital plan that you can start sending around to people. So that was the priority. We then have an identified where we were going to dig. Um, in collaboration with CADU, making sure that uh, we had the consent to undertake this. One of the priorities was to see how, if at all, there was any significant archaeological deposits beneath the surface, had all this erosion, this bicycle track, had it actually cut into it? Was there anything still left? There was, we, the, the uh, heritage assessment had picked up remarks about the fact that with it being a, a prospect site for the town hall, there was, rumors of there being tennis courts up there uh it'd been leveled and really if they wanted to bring the public to the site and improve it and put public access did they need to worry at all about any archaeological remains if they were at all there so these trenches were put in place to target those areas because if you've got an area that's already heavily eroded and you want to improve public access that's probably the best place to put it because you're not removing any archaeology. So you could put staircases and ramps and things in there. So that was our remit on this occasion, just to look specifically at these areas. 
So onwards, we um, opened up a large trench. This is trench one. Um, as ever, these things, the early parts of any excavation takes quite some time because with your volunteer base, you'd have to teach them technique, take it slowly. As archaeologists in the room, you'll probably all recognize the fact that that's probably the last thing you need to do as professional archaeologists when it gets through all that overburden and get down to the significant stuff. But that's not teaching your crew anything. So we've got to go through it nice and slow and refine the techniques. So we, this was our main trench. So people would spend a little bit of time on the smaller trenches, honing their skills with the nursery slopes, so to speak. And then once they really got up to speed, they were brought into this area with my colleague, Richard Hankinson, who then took over. Um, we'll just hold that thought there for the moment. So tell you a little bit about our journey through we went down about 150 mil, something like that. Good ground coverage. You can see all that in section at the side there. Um, the first thing that struck us was there was no tennis court. And the bicycle track had not actually impacted upon the site. And in fact, quite a great deal of material had been brought onto the area from around the town somewhere locally. And... Really good ground coverage. At some time around about the end of the 19th century, a lot of material had been brought onto the site and to level it for purposes we don't understand at the moment. But the interesting thing was in that material, this is what kept the volunteers hooked and interested. And this is it's always difficult with a community archaeology dig, as you'll appreciate. It's nice to find things and you want trays full of flowing over with lots of bling and things. And so they can learn all about the pottery. And this, this is where this was a real win-win situation because we had all this material that had been brought onto site and it was full of ceramics and metalwork from a wide range. Um, clearly this material hadn't come from off the mound, but it was useful to see, and you'll see some of it out in the foyer. Um, we had medieval tiles, fragments of, and lots and lots of different types of 17th, 18th, 19th century pottery. So it's quite a useful journey for the trainees in that respect, in finds, identification. Um, so where do we get to? Well, limited in what we could excavate because this is your first season with a new team of, and um, because we had 120, we weren't getting the consistency. People were with us for a day or so, and then it was change of face again and change of face. So we had to keep resetting and re relearning. Um, so you, you've got minimal targets and objectives you can go for, but the main thing is just to find out where the significant archaeology is and at what level. So it, photographs are a little bit dull. I mean, I'm afraid it's because of the time of the year when these were taken and the nature of the archaeology. On the right-hand side, that stone ribbon you can see there, that is a medieval embankment that's been truncated by the bike tracks. We know that because we found 12th, 13th century pottery in amongst it and nothing else. We came down to it and once we cleared all the 18th and 19th century debris off, we were left with this embankment here. So that was a good place to stop. That's the early, at that point, that was the earliest archaeology we saw on site. So we know there's medieval activity on site. The linear going through the middle with the number 106, that was quite a late thing that's gone in. We can tell you that dates to around about 1640s, 1650s. So it was bang on the Civil War period. And um, there was lots of lead splatter and we were picking up castings from making musket shot. We've got, and again, you'll see it out in the foyer, um, little clay pipe bowls, which are dated to around about 1640s and there was little bits of canister shot and different caliber bu bullets so, and nothing else no no pottery with it but lots of lead work so it's quite a leap of faith but we know that that particular feature dates from around the mid 17th century which at the moment what we're hanging on that is that we're seeing some kind of works going on to do with the defense of um Newtown Mound I can tell as well, I just didn't mention it for those who didn't know, King Charles I did visit and stay at Newtown Hall overnight whilst in the area during this period and did inspect 
the works that were going on in and around Newtown, and we've got a record of that. So it's quite possible that he actually physically came up and stood on top of Newtown Mound. Hopefully it looked a little bit more interesting than it did there. Um, over to the left where it says 108, we've got, uh, we know that the material in there dated a little bit earlier than the 17th century. We're starting to pick up a little bit more pottery from an earlier period. That's as far as we got with our excavation there because that was a good point to stop. We'd identified where the archaeology was. Again, that's <laughs> after the hurricane hit it. Um, so whilst all this was going on, here in the Davis Gallery um, across the road, they very kindly gave us a facility to, to use for our finds lab. Um, so we would break out and people were helping to wash and process all the finds there. Um, we didn't have a discard policy at that time, so we kept everything. Uh, so we've got a lot of work there to go through. Uh, but uh, it was an absolute awesome effort by these guys. So there we go. A uh, little pipe bowl, 1640s, top left. Um, that particular ammunition calibre shot, that's actually slightly later, and that was in that was in deposits overlying the Civil War stuff, so that's not the stuff I was talking about before, that sort of Georgian period. The tile there in my grubby hand, that's part of a tile that looked like that. We recognise that one. Uh, I've seen it at St. Asif Cathedral, and I've seen it at Strata Marcella and Strata Florida. Um, it's uh, apparently is manufactured in a kiln somewhere around Montgomeryshire. So 13th century. But if you've got to build West Abbey in Shropshire, you can see it there in the crazy paving that they've where they've put together all the medieval tiles. You can spot it there as well. So that was a nice find. Now, what on earth a medieval 13th century tile is doing on site is a story in itself. Our best guess at the moment is St. Mary's Church, which is ruined over on the corner of the river uh, at the top end of town. Uh, that dates to around about 1250s, so it's quite possible that those tiles might have come from that area. What sort of size is that mound? It's five metres high. Yeah. Um, you know, you tripped me up there with that one. <laughs> I haven't got an exact... Measurement for it, sorry. Um, in comparison to other mots I've worked on, if this is where that question's going, it's comparative with a smaller border type of mot and bailey size. But um, the shape is slightly disconcerting. Uh, this, this side here on the northeast side, where it's been like a lodge and stuff, it, it doesn't seem to make any sense, like it's been altered slightly. So going over to the trench two, I think it was, um, this is the site of the, the nursery slope, as I called it. This was the site of the so-called summer house gazebo and possibly where the building was found in the early 1900s by the Royal Commission. That, by the way, they didn't write a report. On that, there was no written record of it. It was just a one-line entry, so we had nothing to go on there. Um, worked away, learnt their techniques there, arrived at zero. We found nothing there other, other than lots of artefacts from different periods, but they took it right down until we got down to the... This material on the right is actual medieval mound material, or at least certainly dating from that period. Everything else overlying it was just full of 17th, 18th and 19th century debris. So again, it was a, a good haul of artifacts for them to train with, but no sign of any structures, no post holes, um, and certainly no sign of the building that the Royal Commission had. So that pretty much summed up our excavation on the mound. Um, we certainly have 
demonstrated that there is archaeological deposits there worth looking at. We need to go back. Uh, there are plans to go back in the spring and specifically reopen the larger trench and get below the Civil War stuff and start to see if we can actually find... We did start to see... We did some little test pits up and down. We did start to see structures and certainly pits and posts that predate the 1600s. So we want to have a look at that and uh, get a little bit more of an idea to aid with the interpretation of the site, if nothing else. So whilst all this was going on, um, we took a small team out to the linear bank there. Um, note to self, try and get in there before the town council plants the daffodils ready for St. David's Day, because this one wasn't going to go down too well. Um, we wanted to put a big trench through them, and the, but every day went by and it started blooming up all these yellow daffodils. It's like, oh, goodness me, I'm going to be in the uh, front page of the local press, archaeologist trash blooming new town. So um, we had to curtail our plans slightly as to how we... So we came to the other side where we couldn't be seen. We were hiding this side. And uh, decided to put a trench through here. So there, that's, that's my snipped back uh, version. It's interesting to note how it ends there and heads straight under the council buildings here. We do have plans over the coming weeks to do a little geophysical survey in that gap to see if this earthwork or at least the associated defensive ditch that we found runs through because we'd like to see if it ties in with the mound. Um, but for the time being, just coming back to 2022, that was where we were targeting. So we agreed to do it with a machine initially just to get through because we were working on the idea that one side of us was saying this is possibly a modern linear earthwork and therefore we'll go through and we'll come across lots of 18th and 19th century pottery. Truth of the matter was, we didn't. We didn't see a thing that was modern. Here's a really nice section looking down from the top of the, the, the monument, going down onto the ground surface, which is quite orange, as you can see there. That's a lot of iron panning. Now, I've spent two decades of my life working with the Trust, um, taking apart Watts Dyke and Short Dykes and Offers Dykes. So I'm no stranger to put sections through linear banks and earthworks. So you, on that journey, you hone your skills in recognising buried ground surfaces, whether something's been dug by hand, been put there by machine, you could just tell as an archaeologist. Um, some of you in the room will understand where I'm going with that. Uh, and you can just figure it out, how it's been put together. And it st struck me straight away that this was hand-built, hand dug by hand, and in a section that looks like that. There it is. Get some really good stratigraphy through there. If that was 17th, 18th and 19th century, as we'd seen on the mound, you would expect somewhere in that stratigraphy to start finding some kind of ceramic builder material, tiny flecks of it. It gets everywhere. It's like photocopy toner when you spill the tray. It just gets in there. That was absolutely clean as a whistle, top to bottom. There was, and comparative to Offers Dyke, Watts Dyke. Um, in the sense that there was nothing you could date until you got to the bottom. It was just lines and lines of charcoal and iron panning, gra very ground surfaces there. You can see the different layers where they've dug through the, the soils uh, whilst they're digging it. The, and these this is constructed by digging a ditch, and the material from the ditch gets thrown up, constructs the, the bank. This bank is, as you can see, about just shy of two metres, 1.9 metres high. So we're assuming you could probably double that because most of that's going to be pushed down or has been eroded back down into the ditch. As it stands now, it's about seven and a half, eight metres wide, but because of daffodils, I couldn't test how wide that was. So that's, and the ditch that we saw, which is this bit in the front here, um, Projected probably five to six meters wide. I've only, it's quite steep, but it's going underneath 
the blessed railway track. <laughs> so there's a conversation there to be had with them to just ask them if we could just move that for a moment. Um, and of course, because of the nature and the depth of this um, in that environment and health and safety, you've certainly got issues with volunteers. You can't explore this like you want to because you're at a depth that is illegal. So you need to be able to expand out. So straight away, we've, there was a limit to where we could take this. But um, suddenly this became the really interesting part of this excavation. Um, we noted as well, what did I say? Uh, we had about... It was about 1.2, 1.3 meters deep. We stopped. This is the ditch now. Um, the interesting thing here is just to reaffirm the fact that we were starting to realize we were looking at something considerably older than 1700s. There's a line of bottles in there shining. If you, if you look at the ranging rod about halfway down, you can see all that debris, that material. That was a cache of ceramics and bottles from a very, very specific timeline. And if you look out on the table out there, you'll see some of the material put there. And it all dates to around about 1720 to 1760. There's a very tight capsule of material. There was um, not onion bottles, but mallet bottles, which is the next transition in that period. They have seals on them. There's some of the bottles. That's just a some idea of it. Um, salt glazed stone stoneware there. That tray you can see there. Before you leave today, have a look on the table over there. Well, due to the hurricane and the rainy weather, we had a situation where um, they had a, quite a bit of time on their hands, the volunteers to wash and put things together, and they managed out of this dinner set, which is quite high status white stone glazeware. They managed to put together a platter for me and glue it all together which is a phenomenal piece of work and um there's lots of other dinner plate items there but all together with all these mallet bottles um of which three of them we had a family seal on and the institute for um welsh estates had a look at the seal and they confirmed it was john price of newtown hall and his personalised seal on the bottles, which is quite a nice little find for the fifth baronet because he just changed the heraldry ever so slightly so we knew exactly who it was. So this material has been dumped from, from Newtown Hall into the ditch, but the thing is, it's right at the top. So you know that your ditch fills from that point onwards are predating 1720. If you go down two, half, three metres, you're starting to think this is medieval. If it's not, if this linear earthwork isn't an English Civil War defence on the southeast side, then it could be part of the town defences, which to our knowledge today are lost. Uh, we don't know where they are. So it's quite possible now that this linear earthwork that's underneath our feet, or was, <laughs> the ditch is still out there, um, we might possibly have found the sole upstanding remains of the medieval defences of Newtown, which is quite something. Um, in the meantime, we have finest collection of early 1700s transitional bottles, which uh, as an archaeologist, you just throw these away normally, but suddenly I've been quite hooked. And we've, we have quite a study there, quite a collection. Um, and also we can go back we do plan to go back and re-excavate properly by hand because most of this was hit with a JCB bucket, so we can step down. For those of you who are interested in your, bollet, your bottles, um, it, was, it was useful for me on this journey to, to just remind myself when corkage came into being, uh, which is a little bit later after this period, so 1760s, 1770s. So imagine these bottles. That, um, the only one we've got complete is on the desk out there with the price seal on it. You'll see it. And the um, the idea is that basically you're decanting port or brandy from a barrel and putting it on the table. So there's no. So this is before the storing drink in bottles. So these bottles are purely for just bringing... The, the uh, the drink onto the table um so they certainly didn't have a drink problem did they <laughs> looking at 
They have plenty of access to their own supply of um, fortified wine. That's the salt glazed platter being reconstructed. I can't remember. Can't rec- we did get the name of the manufacturer. We've got a specific gentleman in Stoke on Trent who made it. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it certainly dates to around about 1725, 1730. Um, and I picked that information up off an antique site in America where they were shipping these out to. And um, they were selling them online, complete ones, for about $800. So uh, we'll get the glue out and see what we can do. <laughs> Raise some money for our dig. Uh, quite a nice piece. I usually find, over the years, you find this salt-glazed, fast moulded sort of material in small pieces. I never actually saw it as a complete plate, and I look at it in a different light nowadays. So I've become quite a salt-glazed ceramic nerd now. Uh, there's the little mallet bottle, which is, sort of the, if you can imagine, its granddad is an onion bottle. This is the next little bottle, bottle on. It was complete. I have to put my hands in the air at this point and say it fell off the side of the trench. <laughs> and I can't find a piece of the piece missing, but uh, we put it together and there we go. So, yeah, that's on me, that one. Um, and then we have the other coat of arms on the seals as well. They're quite rare. I don't know whether this actually is the only surviving bottle in existence for the Fifth Baronet Price family, Newtown Hall. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is when we go back and excavate the linear earthwork, we'll make it a lot wider. Now we know where the bottles are, we can hand dig down to that as an exercise and hopefully retrieve more complete uh, dinner sets and things to go with Newtown Hall for display whilst we get on with the, the real grit of actually getting down and dating the ditch and the ground surface, bringing some uh, OSL dating techniques to the, date the bank. And just to kind of finish off, just to go and show how these things come to pass, where I came to this project looking at this painting by John Ingleby, dated 1796, and the perceived wisdom from my colleagues in their heritage assessment based on the write-up on this particular watercolour painting was that this is viewed from the north, and therefore... This linear earthwork here was the one in question that we've been taking apart with pollard, uh, with this ornamental trees on a little pond. Um, they'd missed the fact that there were some buildings behind the trees there. And Street View is a great thing. I went on Street View and I went the other side of and looked at the landscape in the... Uh, Got used to working remotely, you see, so I was looking at that. And uh, we noticed that it's not, it's taken from completely, come 180 degrees, and that's the mott with the ditch. The buildings in the back are the mill house and the mill wheel, and there would have been a race there. And that probably links up with that linear earthwork. So if you look at this, this is the Glan 7 map I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk dating to 1798 and you can see the complex at center there town hall that's the mill there and here's the mill tied into the river seven so it's not a great leap of faith to know that you can link that up water to the right of we know from ladies well area here that there is a running stream called the Tip Stream and River that comes underneath today. And that's what's feeding that mott, uh, that moat with water. So there is a flow of water coming through. So quite a nice little bit of detective work there. Um, that's just looking at a little bit closer there. Going back to this map, you can see it there. The mill house. So I, I believe that that painting was taken from here. And there's your linear bank up there. Yeah. And just if, just to remind ourselves where everything is in relation to today. So there's the medieval town, the known street plan in green. St. Mary's Church I mentioned, 1250s, possibly where there's certainly a record of the medieval tiles from that period coming from up there. Um, 
and then I just noted key places down here where we were working for the audience so they can see where we were and some happy faces and that concludes the um, presentation on our excavation here we are making plans and we are in plans at the moment with Newtown Council with support from CADU to continue excavation uh, next year uh, very targeted excavation and from a research point of view certainly want to get a date for that linear earthwork we came to look at the mound and if I'm honestly hand on heart the big reveal and the big story was all about the linear bank and whether it's part of the medieval defences could even be earlier um, who knows so there we are thank you very much <laughs>